Uh, welcome to CS 4510. This is lecture 02A. It's Thursday. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Non-Determinism. So um, we, oh yeah, by the way, there's a stain on my shirt. Everyone's been looking at it, everyone's pointing it out. My boss pointed it out. I have to point it out before everyone else stares at it the whole time. So I don't know how it got there. But it got there 20 minutes before class started. So let's get that out the way. Um, right, non-determinism. Last time, what did we do? We talked about strings, formal language theory. We talked about DFAs. We talked about the ability of DFAs to uh, accept or not accept uh, certain languages for the ability to decide certain things. And then we also mentioned at the end the DFA model is somewhat limited on purpose. So let's take the DFA model and try to extend it in some way and see what we can get out of that. So recall the formal definition of DFA was we had a Q, finite set of states, sigma, a finite alphabet. We had a designated start state. We had a transition function. And then we had a set of final states, right? That was the tuple we defined a DFA formally, even if it had you know, a really nice uh, state diagram picture. And of these parts, uh, like what's the most impor important part to change? Really, none of the parts are moving. Right, Q, changing Q may not really help us. Changing sigma may not really help us. Changing which state you start at may not really help us. Uh, changing how you accept may not really help us. But changing how you perform the computation probably will help us. So we're going to change delta. Um, we're going to define a new kind of automaton called a non-deterministic finite automaton. We're going to relax the definition of delta to get this definition of an NFA and hope that the definition of an NFA is more general than the definition of a DFA. And because it's a generalization, maybe it can do more things. Maybe it can have more power. Um, so we're going to change delta in uh, three important ways. First is this notion of implicit rejection. Recall that the. Um, um, Transition function had to be well defined, right? If the transition function was not well defined, uh, the DFA was not correctly defined, right? So what we may allow is you to not define uh, a specific transition and just understand that as an immediate return uh, false, just a reject. If uh, undefined transitions uh, reject. So uh, another way to think of that is like in C, you know, if you have undefined behavior, the program may still continue. If at any point you have an undefined behavior in the NFA, you immediately reject. Computation ceases. Um, this is not such a general thing. If we've had some computation like this, right? Let's say we had some DFA, and let's say we wanted to reject every time, reject every time we saw a B. What you would do is you would have a, a, a purgatory state, and everything would go in there, right? Um, but this, for larger and larger DFAs, gets kind of ugly to have this in, to have this kind of purgatory state here for a large case of whenever you want to throw away the input, right? You want to continue when you see good input and ignore it when you don't see good input. Hopefully, so instead of drawing it like this, what we're going to allow you to do is just have uh, undefined transitions. So if the transition is not defined, then you just know to reject implicitly. For example, uh, we gave a DFA last time. It begins with an A, right? And we gave the DFA as follows. Oops. Uh, so if you see an A, you, you go to the good purgatory and you stay there and you accept. If, if you don't see an A on the first symbol, you go to Q2 and you stay there. Um, if we were to do a lot of this with implicit uh, rejection, we would do the following.
What is the computation on this device if you start with a B? The way we say it is you're here, there is no transition defined for if you see a B, you reject. There's just a trash can, we just don't draw it anymore. That's all implicit rejection is, right? Questions about implicit rejection? One of the three powers we're going to give our transition function. Kind of an easy one. Uh, number two is this idea of um, uh, epsilon transitions. So you can think of a transition in a DFA as cost. It costs a letter off the front of the input. Um, but there's also something at the front of every input of every word, which is the empty string. The empty string is a prefix of every word. So what we do is we allow you to define a transition that takes nothing. So let's say you had this DFA. Right? Something like this. There's, it's not every transition is defined. There's certainly some implicit rejection going on. What strings does this accept? It accepts A, uh, AB, ABB, ABBB, right? <coughs> and so on. It only accepts strings of that form, right? Um, what if I added an epsilon here? Well, we mean the epsilon here basically and without the epsilon, it costs a letter off the front of the input. The epsilon is free. It's like when you're playing the game Snakes and Ladders and you land on the go to jail. Getting my board games mixed up. You land on the thing, you just go to the thing for free, right? In fact, not only do you go to the thing for free, you can choose to go to the thing for free. So if you're at Q0 here and you see a, uh, if you're at Q0, you can just teleport yourself to Q1, but you may not teleport yourself back. Right. So if we add the epsilon here, it currently accepts all of these strings, but it also accepts some more strings. What is, what's another string this this uh, this accepts now? B. B. There's a smaller string it accepts. Accepts the empty string. Even though the start state is not accepting, here's the computation on this with the empty string. Begin at the start state. Take the epsilon transition. Okay. I mean, you're done, right? Uh, this also accepts BB, BBB, and so on, right? For A comma epsilon, the way you can think of that is that there are two transitions, and which one you take is a choice of whether or not you choose to put an A in front of the word or not, right? But afterwards, it's all Bs. Questions on that? Yeah? So what if you had AB as your string, and you chose epsilon first? Then you'd have A, B gets rejected? Correct. But let's talk about that third option right now. A, that is a computation on this where A, B is accepted. There's one computation where A, B is accepted, and another computation where A, B is rejected. These are not three separate ideas. You need the third one, which is non-determinism. We relax our uh, transition function even farther. You see an A and you're at Q2, where do you go? But there's a transition from A to Q1. Both. Why did you say Q2 first? Because I was reading from the bottom of the top. Oh, but then you would have, I see, OK. Yeah, so, it, uh, so you just didn't finish reading the diagram. Yeah. Okay, I thought, I, thought you were, I thought you were thinking two was greater than one or something. Um, Non-determinism is this power. Determinism is a sequence of decisions have been made for you, and you must follow all of them exactly. Non-determinism, there's many ways to think about this. And today's lecture is simply coping with non-determinism. Non-determinism is you have a set of options, and you choose one. Now, how, does that, how do we fit this into... Uh, and a model of accepting strings or not. So we say an NFA accepts a string, accepts a string, if uh, there exists a computation path, a set of choices uh, to an accept state. Uh, an NFA rejects a string. 
When does an NFA reject a string? When should, ideally, if this is to be well defined, when should an NFA reject a string? For all paths it rejects. If it doesn't accept, it must reject. So you simply take the negation. Every computation path on that specific word leads to a reject state, either implicit rejection or otherwise. So this is the definition. These are the three powers we are granting uh, an NFA. We'll talk a little bit more about this third one. And really, the second one is the third one. Because here, you're choosing A or not A. You're choosing, you get to choose between those. That's an epsilon. You have two transitions you can choose from. We'll talk about non-determinism uh, the whole lecture today. But before that, let's just define what the NFA is, the formal definition of an NFA. It's going to be defined identical to a DFA, in fact, with some slight adjustments. Q, sigma, Q0, delta, and F. Q is a finite set of states. Note that the definition is going to only have one start state still. Sigma, finite alphabet, like a comma b. Um, Q0 is one element of Q. The transition function is important. What are the parameters of the transition function? What are the parameters of the transition function of the DFA? You take on a single state, you take on a single symbol, and you output a single state, right? Can you guys see that, maybe? Okay, what should the what should the parameters of the of the non-deterministic transition function be? Kind of an open-ended question. Take like something in the power set of Q cross sigma. Well, as input, we would take. Well, so when you perform the computation, you're still at a single you're at a single state or you're at several states. But for each state, we want to define a transitions. So when we're, rather than the computation occurring, think about how we would draw the picture. So we're going to take a single state, OK? Then we're going to take a symbol or not take a symbol. How would we draw that? Epsilon. Everyone understand what that notation means? We choose a letter of the alphabet or the epsilon symbol. And then we go to what? A set of states. So the codomain of the set of states is going to be the power set. It's defined this way to make sure it's a function and not a relation, right? Every relation can be converted to a function if you convert the codomain to the power set of the pre previous relations codomain, right? So that's the transition function for the NFA, the formal definition of the transition function. F, boring, you would expect that. Finite set of states. The final or accepting states. So how do you actually like compute with the NFA? How do you determine if it reaches an accept state or not? Uh, that's challenging. That's like, uh, uh, I mean, we're deterministic people. So understanding non-determinism is not easy for us. We don't know how to comprehend it exactly. Uh, but we can sort of have uh, some non-deterministic coping strategies for, uh, excuse me, some deterministic coping strategies for non-determinism. Have you guys heard the word non-determinism in a different context? You may have heard it uh, like non-deterministic behavior with respect to a program having unexpected output or behavior. And what that's sort of a, uh, a misdefinition. That's not correct definition of what non-determinism is. Sometimes people use the word non-deterministic behavior to mean a program is randomized. Somehow randomness is part of the input. And the behavior of the program is a function of this randomness. That's not really what non-determinism means here. There's no, there is not really a definition of randomness here. One of the coping mechanisms we'll talk about in a second is using randomness. But it's not really a randomized computation. Certainly, the NFA still accepts a string or still rejects a string. The definition of existing a computation path forces that. right? So it's not really, um, that's sort of a, 
uh, a translation thing that you've seen, perhaps. There are, three, there are three coping strategies. Let's say you wanted to write a program to determine if an NFA accepted a word or not. What would you do? If I gave you an NFA and a string and I asked you how to determine if the NFA accepts the string. Brute force, that, there's a faster algorithm. That's true, actually, that would be fine. Brute force. What's, but what's another algorithm? Like a DFA or DFS. DFS or even BFS, yeah. Graph traversal. Like BFS. Brute force search, no. Breath force search, right? So BFS would work the best. DFS probably worked just as well. Um, Here's another thing, though. The, the, there's no notion of measuring time. Here's the advantage. Both of those may not take exactly linear time. But we said that the DFA does take exactly n steps. Here's the difference between those two. That's just a deterministic coping mechanism, because the NFA measures time differently. It still also takes exactly n steps. The number of steps the NFA takes is exactly the word, the word length. Even if you were to simulate this yourself, unfortunately, it may take a little more than n steps. Uh, because you're a deterministic person, you have to do this deterministic coping mechanism. Um, two, a lucky coin. You have a lucky coin. You're, you're walking along the NFA, and you come to a fork in the road. You come to a literal, uh, uh, which way do you go? What you do is you flip a coin. Uh, and it's a lucky coin. So it has, with probability one, the right answer. It'll tell you which state to go to if you are to reach an accept state. You have such perfect ability of guessing that this coin works for you every single time. If there is an accept path you can reach, it'll tell you which way to go. So the lucky coin, through this godlike unimaginable power, will guide you towards the accept state. This is another coping mechanism. You just sort of guess, and sometimes the, 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 the language is said this way, non-deterministically guess the path. And then, wow, you found the answer. Now, that's not an algorithms thing. That's purely a non-deterministic thing. But that's the power we have. Questions on the lucky coin analogy? Again, not randomized. Sorry, about the earlier one, you said that it would be still the length of the string. Yeah. If you have a transition that has epsilon in it, couldn't you just keep doing that one over and over again? Implicitly, isn't there a self loop of epsilon in every state? The epsilon, the non-deterministic time is measured with a weird stopwatch. The epsilon transition, I would say, takes no time. It's not, it's not well defined what that means, but certainly you can believe, believe uh, it should take linear time in the weird NFA world and not with our BFS analogy. Yeah? How do you know how the lucky coin works? So like, at a given state, how do you know which way to go? Such you flip a coin, and the coin is lucky, and it tells you which way to go. Okay. You need faith in the coin. Okay. This, is a, this is not my analogy. This is... This is, a, this is the literature. This is how non-determinism works. You're deterministic, OK? The, the neurons are firing in your brain in such a way that can be de described by the laws of physics, which are deterministic. So I'm saying you, guess the, you, you get, ask the coin, and it'll, with probability one, it'll tell you which way to go. You don't know what I'm talking about, right? But the, luck, the coin is lucky. You have to have faith in the coin, and it'll take you to the right path. Do you have faith in the coin? Not yet. Not yet? OK. The NFA has access to the coin. It knows which way to go. And by which way to go, I mean which way will go towards the accepting computation. Right. Which way is the accepting path, the accept state. Uh, third um, is time travel, alternate timelines. So every science fiction has uh, its own rules of how time travel works. Like you're not allowed to kill your uncle, or like you, maybe you can't. You go into the past, but then you can't see. You only have weird prophetic visions, hallucinations of the past. Um, maybe you can go in the past, and then you can like kill your uncle, and something like this happens. So t t another uh, analogy is with time travel. And maybe you've seen some. Have you guys seen that episode of Community where they roll the die? Have you seen Community? You guys have not seen. You guys born in like 2006 or something? You've seen Community? Okay. There's that episode with the, where he rolls the die, and. Um, there's every time, the episode is seven short sections where each section <laughs> is what had happened if the die rolled a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And those outcomes are who has to go pick up the pizza. And they refilm the entire scene based off of who's missing from that one scene and like what happens, you know? And then the seventh 
uh, section that like, catches the die and stops it from rolling and makes some great compromise, something like this. So you can think of it as like you have the Rick and Morty button, uh, the family guy cutaway uh, a skill, and you come to a fork in the road, you copy all of time and space and matter into an alternate timeline, and then the up path is what had happened if you had done that thing, and the bottom path is what had happened if you had not done that thing, right? So then eventually, if, you re if one of those paths, which may also split a path, if you reach an accept state, you push another Rick and Morty button, and all the timelines collapse back, and you accept. Yes? This is like just splitting it into a bunch of DFAs, and with just assuming that there's only one accepting path. Well, important in this analogy is that it still takes linear time. Time is there for the depth of the computation, right? Time moves that way. This, is, this time is occurring parallel. So you can assume, like, every time I'm, suppose I'm walking along a DFA, an NFA. Suppose I'm walking along that, along that NFA. And I, and I choose to take the A transition. I just split time. Some, there's another version of me in the same room, in the same class, that took the epsilon transition. And they're computing on the NFA. And I'm like, well, I reach an accept state. So time limits collapse back down. So yes, in some sense, the, 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 it's, it is like running on a DFA. Each locally in the timeline, it's as if you're running on a deterministic automaton, but the non-determinism is done with the timelines. Nice. Well, like, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just regarding the length of time it takes for something to complete. Like if you have an NFA that finishes in finite time, which it has to because you give it a string of finite length, couldn't you, like with a sufficiently large algorithm, create a DFA that does all the same things that it does? It happened last year. Continue. Like, uh, that's the deterministic coping strategy of class number one. Would you agree? We'll talk about that as, as later after. Okay. Questions on these three coping strategies? Okay. Um, you may have heard of the P versus NP problem. We'll talk about that like a third of the course. It's my favorite problem ever. Uh, you have some 3510 level definition of what NP is as the class of deterministically verifiable computation, like SAT is polynomial time verifiable, it's NP complete, right, all these things. But people joke NP stands for not polynomial. That's not what it stands for. NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. So in fact, P is like algorithms. NP is like algorithms with non-determinism. So it's not verifiable computation. In fact, it's this weird thing. If you gave, what happens if you gave this to a computer and not an NFA? That's what NP actually is. But that's too hard for people to do. So we say, and actually we'll prove it's equivalent to verifiable computation. Do you guys remember giving verifiers to prove a problem as an NP? Yeah, that's, that's, you're actually giving a non-deterministic algorithm. The same thing. The coin, in some sense, is your certificate. It's your witness. Um, we'll have to talk about that like in a month or two. Um, right. So let's do a few NFAs. Let's do a couple NFAs. Um, let's do the NFA, uh, an NFA for the language. Uh, w is in uh, sigma star, uh, and W ends with uh, A, A. Right. So you may be able to give a DFA for this. Let's do the DFA first, right? The DFA would look like this. You see an A. Great, you continue the computation. And what happens if you see a B, you reset. And if you are, you only start on this if you see a B, if you see an A. So let's say you see a B there. Now, if you're at the second state, that means you've seen an A, and you want to see another A. So um, what happens if you're at this state and you see a B? You go all the way back, right? And this state accepts. And if you're at this state and you see an A, you could stay there, right? Is that correct? If, is that a DFA? All my transitions are defined? Right, double check my work. Um, here's what I can do instead of non-determinism. Non-determinism, non the reason I love uh, this class, non-determinism allows you to be a lazy programmer. Uh, how do I know when I'm, this one has basically a bunch of try-catch nonsense in there. It has all the edge cases. Every if has an else in some sense. I want to simply um, take this transition when I'm exactly two from the end of the input. Okay, 
that'll accept the strings. If I start there, if I start going down that path, and if I'm two away from the end, then I'll accept. Would you agree? Now, I only want to go down that path when I'm two away from the end. So how do I know when I'm two away from the end to, to choose to go down that path? Suppose I now have the power of non-determinism. What can I do to make sure that I only go down that path when I'm two away from the end? I don't loop to the first node that's A, B. You're not using enough wizardly words. It's, you have to say, I non-deterministically guess when I'm two letters away from the end of the word, and then I'll take the thing. This is an NFA, not a DFA. Why? Because A has multiple transitions in the start state. Yeah, there's two outgoing trans A transitions. Uh, let's call this Q0, and let's call this Q1, and let's call this Q2. Uh, what is delta of Q0, comma A? It's the set containing Q0, Q1. Right? There's a, there's a transition from Q0 to Q0, and there's a transition from Q0 to Q1. Right? Now, what about a computation with multiple A's? That's not the, let's say you guess incorrectly. What happens? Let's consider the computation of this string on the word A, 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 A. Okay? Now, that ends with two A's, and it should accept. But let's consider we guess we're from the end incorrectly. Right? If you're in the lucky coin analogy, you know you're going to take Q0, Q0, and then you're going to take Q1 when you're two away from the end. You'll guess correctly, non-deterministically guess when you're there. But if you don't do that, let's just see what happens with our other deterministic coping strategies. How many ways are there to guess? To, to, to your first, if you see an A here, you can choose Q0 or Q1. So let's just consider all possible ways you can guess when to go to Q1 instead of staying at Q0. There's this way. Here's another one. Another. Those are, the, those are the all. Each of these represents a computation. The dotted line represents where you stop going to Q0 and you stay at Q1. Okay? So here, let's say you never stayed at Q1. The first A you see, you're going to go to Q1. Then you're going to see another A. You're going to go to Q2. Then you're going to see another A. What do you do? You reject because it's implicit. Implicit rejection. So that's a reject. Let's say you, you saw an A. You go, go to Q0. You see an A, now you go to Q1. You see an A, you go to Q2. The NFA only accepts if it's run out of input. After you've run out of, in, out, out of input, you can only take epsilon transitions, but you must read the entire input. You have an A left, and you're at Q2. What do you do? Reject again. You implicitly reject again. Let's say you guess right there in the middle. Q0, you stay. Q0, you stay. Q1, Q2. You're out of input. You landed on a reject state. Excuse me, on an accept state. So this computation <coughs> accepts. Let's say you guess. Th these correspond to guessing too early. You implicitly reject. If you guess the Goldilocks position, you're great. If you guess too late, let's see what happens. Read an A, read an A, read an A, and then read an A. So you're going to go Q0, Q0, Q0. Now you have one A left. Let's say now you go to Q1. You stop on Q1. There are no epsilon transitions to find. You have to stay with Q1. What does that mean? Q1 is rejecting. So you just reject. Reject on Q1. Now what if you guess your last A with this one? Or none of them, in fact. Q0, 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 Q0. Well. Reject on Q0. Right? Question? Is there sort of an implicit self loop with epsilon on the accepting states? Because, like, I could. On all states. Okay. A, A, epsilon, 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 A, epsilon, epsilon. Right? Yeah. So you don't read any input when you take an epsilon transition. Right? Correct. Yes, it does not perturb the input. Um, the epsilon transition will be a very useful tool. We'll, we'll get very into the weeds with that one. Um, but look, five computation paths on this one word, on this one NFA. Two of them, four of them reject, one accepts. So does this NFA accept the word or not? It accepts. We define an NFA to accept a string if there exists a computation path. 
And as long as one of them accepts, we're good. So because this computation path accepts, this NFA accepts the word. Right. Any questions on this example of an NFA? Yeah. Correct. <coughs> if you have some epsilon transition, you get to go from one state to the other without reading the input. Otherwise, every transition costs a letter off the front of your word, right? So the epsilon is a no cost toll road. There's nothing to pay. And it exists for every arrow implicitly. No. I mean, so there is, like if, like, if you have a self loop of an epsilon transition, the question is that it's useless. That doesn't really help. It doesn't, there's, it, they have to be explicitly drawn. Yeah. Let's do two more examples. Consider um, W is in sigma star. This one you can do almost the same way. W and W uh, has a B, has B uh, three places. I'll say third from the right. So basically what this looks like is there's, there's a bunch of words, there's a B, and then there's exactly two letters. So we want to uh, write a DFA, an NFA for this language, right? So how do you do that? Well, how's, what's the NFA look like for this one? Well, what you're going to do by the power of non-determinism, just guess when you're at the right B and hope it works. Now, what about the other two letters? I don't care. Right. The prefix, I'm also just going to guess. Right. Easy. Great part about the NFA is the amount of lazy programming. I'm just going to guess I have the answer and do a little bit of handling to make sure it's right. That's really powerful. Um, the NF, what about the DFA for this? What is the strategy to build the DFA for this? Do we know? It, three things from the light. So if, you, if it was ending with a B, you could test that easy. If it was two away from the right, you might be able to do that easily. Three away from the right, it sounds a little harder. Um, my DFA for this has, you won't believe it, like 15 states. I would encourage you to try to work this out. Um, I'm not going to uh, draw the DFA because I don't want to. I don't care. Uh, but I'll tell you the answer to this question is basically you have to make one state for every possible suffix of length three plus a small binary tree of states that lead up into the big DFA. You basically need a sliding window to keep track of all three things that you've seen in the past. So for example, if you were at Q, let's say uh, A, B, B, that means the last thing you saw was A, B, B, right? Then if you see a B, you're going to go to, um, no, I'll say if you see an A. If you see an A, you're going to go to Q, uh, B, B, A, like that, right? These are the last three things you saw. A is now the fourth thing you saw. You can forget about it. You can remember that you saw B, B. Now, because we want B third from the right, this we've seen three from the right that without being an accept state. Something like this, little sliding window. This takes like eight states and then like seven to onboard. Something like this, right? Because what about all the strings of length two? You need to make sure those are rejected, but you enter the DFA in the correct way. Uh, so 15 states. And in fact, you can prove you probably can't do this one with less. Now, suppose instead of three states from the right, what if I did n, n symbols from the right? You would need like, for, this, for the DFA, you would need about two to the n states, right? Because you need this all substrings of length two uh, of n. Uh, for this one, what's the size of the NFA in terms of n? 
if you want to be n from the right, from the right. Approximately like uh, linear size, right? So the NFA is also smaller. It's more efficient, right? It's an exercise for you to prove that, that this, this specific language could not be done with smaller, a few, fewer states. But here, great power of the NFA. I don't have to write down 15 things. I'm not, I've never written down 15 things in my life. Uh, four things is good enough. So the pow by the power of non-determinism, I just guess all that ugly stuff. I don't care about it. And I simply guess the correct position, and I carry myself forward. That's the really the useful part about the NFA. It makes programming extremely easy. Any questions on this example? OK, let's do another one. Let's do an arithmetic progression. Let's do uh, a to xn plus y where n is some number, and x, y are constants. This one can be done. We did something like this with a, with a uh, DFA. It's actually not too hard. But you can actually do it with an NFA a little easier. What you do is you basically make a cycle. Right? You make a cycle of length x. And then you make a tail of length y. Uh, why is this an NFA? Because every time you see a b, it's just implicitly rejected. Sure. Suppose I then added an implicit, uh, explicit rejection. The two A's after. Yeah, from the start state, you can choose to go on the loop-de-loop, -loop, or you can choose to go on the tail. Loop-de-loop, 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 tail. When you tail, you accept. Consider all the rejecting computations that this one does. There's a lot of them. It's hard to keep track of them. But that's fine. What you do is you non-deterministically guess how many times to go on the loop-de-loop. -loop. This transition really says, do I go to the end, or do I go in the loop another time? Right? Let's say, let's say x was 3 and y was 5 or something. You'd go. Went, for each n, and then you would go the little tail, right? Now, you could do this deterministically really easy if y was kind of smaller than x. You would just choose the accept state on the cycle, like we did mod 3, 4. When we did uh, 3, 4 mod 7, we really did um, as if the third or fourth on the cycle of length 7 was there. Now, this one could be done the same. However, by the power of non-determinism, it allows me to be a worse programmer. I can simply guess when I'm uh, exactly y from the end after taking a cycle of, of uh, x times n number of a's. So that's uh, how that, that how this one works. Any questions on this one? Hopefully you understand the power of non-determinism. You can think, wow, I'm just going to make this really easy on myself. This part's going to be very simple. Uh, NFAs are incredibly useful uh, with programming. Uh, like this, this is so thankful. Like, for example, we could program in an NFA having more than one start state. Like, by definition, it's only allowed one start state. But how can we create an NFA as if it had two start states? Add an epsilon transition to the other start state. If you want it to have two start states, you want it to start on one or the other. Uh, well, what do you do? All you do is add a single new start state and then epsilon transition to both of the old start states. The computation non-deterministically guesses on which one you're going to go. Right? Which do you go up or low? Uh, you guess. If this was an NFA and this was an NFA and you added a start state like this, what language does this compute? Let's say this was some NFA. Let's say this was some other NFA. If we add an epsilon from the start state like this, what language is computed? The union. You can guess to go above and accept all those strings. If any string is in accepted by the first NFA, there is a computation that accepts it by guessing to go above. Doesn't matter if, it get, if, if the bottom accepts it or not. If there's a word accepted by the bottom NFA, you can guess to go to the bottom and it'll accept those. So it'll accept exactly the ones that are in both, uh, or in either, excuse me. So it's going to be the union. And we'll talk about this more explicitly uh, Tuesday. But uh, we can pretend we have two start states if we wanted, right? One of the cool things about NFAs. Lots of little powerful things there. 
All right, um, let's take a little break.